original shock wave. But then the helicopters went over and we started a simulated attack on ground zero. And halfway there, my feet were getting hot. And I looked down at my combat boots and the half soles were, you know, curled up, starting to peel off. It was, it, you know, it was that hot. They built uh, two brick houses and they had new cars set around at different intervals. They had sheep and pigs and, and cattle. And we got within probably 200 yards from the crater of the initial blast. This was a tower shot. And I looked over and I couldn't see anything left of those houses. I looked around and there was some sheep but their wool was on fire, and there was some pigs running around squealing. And I could see over on my right, a pig just fell over dead. They had planted trees and had cars, and they had mannequins, you know, sitting in the windows, and, but there was nothing left. Then we, we, we marched back to buses and trucks to go back to camp. They did have a, a guider counter. So all they did was dust us off and run the guider counter over. I, I had a film badge that, that time and a film badge the second time, but eight times in the forward area, I didn't have a film badge. My job was, I was on a detail to take tanks and equipment out and put them in designated spots for a shot. Then after the shot, we would go out and drag them back to Camp Mercury for the scientists to evaluate, you know, how much damage and at what interval and, and, ha and how much radiation there, there was. But like I said, we didn't have any protective equipment. All we had was what a combat infantryman would have in the field. You know, fatigues, a steel pot, an M1 rifle, and the, and the combat boots. And that was all we had. Walter Cronkite was there to that shot. And I'd seen him on TV not too long ago describing this shot. But anyway, they were eight miles, what they call Knob Hill, because that's where all the newsmen was, eight miles back. And they had big goggles on. We didn't have nothing, not a thing. Well, I've had lung problems. I've had bleeding stomach, arthritis. Um, gallbladder trouble, urinary tract trouble. I've had heart problems and heart attacks. But right after that blast when I was a guinea pig, the next day I had bleeding gums. And I lost two weeks after that, my teeth started getting loose. In fact, I reached in there and, and just one just fell out. And I lost seven teeth, and I had terrific um, stomach problems, and then I started hemorrhaging. I had to have stomach surgery. They, they said it was, was ulcers, but I know I didn't have any trouble before. They were bringing these ships from all around, the, all around, you know, into, put in the lagoon down there, Bikini, 
to test the uh, Abel and Baker on. The original three was the test bomb down on White Sands, and then Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the four and five were the two bikini, bikini bombs. The, the Nevada was the target ship, and Nevada laid in the center of the target ships. We laid over on the port quarter. Abel exploded, uh, oh, I, I don't know, 150 yards, something like that, from the Sakawa, not over the battleship, the target ship. It drove that thing together like an accordion. The guys that were in there told me and, and watched it sink. It took about 25 hours to sink it. I can't remember how many hours after that, then we went back into the lagoon and uh, proceeded to do what a seagoing tug does, you know. We hauled contaminated stuff out to, I, I believe, the 40,000 fathom mark and dropped it. This is a seagoing tug now, the ATA-124. And we we done that up until it come time for Baker. Then when, when they got all set up for Baker, then we went out and all the seagoing tugs, you steam around all night in concentric circles until the actual bomb. Now that was the scariest thing I ever saw in my life because when that baker exploded and that big mushroom of water and stuff went up in the air, it looked to me, facing it, like it was from here to that door. And I thought that big wall of water was going to come right out and swamp us, and that's from 10 miles away. Well, at that time, it was quite an interesting deal because we didn't know there was anything down the road and stuff. We didn't know about the so-called radioactivity and that stuff, you know, that, that you could get from nuclear stuff. Uh, they talk about these badges and stuff that, they, that the people wore. I never saw one. I don't know what they looked like. Like I say, with Baker, it just scared the hell out of me. You know, was seeing that big wall of water, but then after it settled down and we steamed back in there, there was a, didn't think anything of it. I was a deckhand on board uh, the USS Renville APA-227 at Operation Hardtack 1. We were six miles from ground zero on surface tests, underwater tests, aerial tests, and what have you. There was one ship as like a destroyer or destroyer escort, escort that was three of them in a row. One was one mile from the point of detonation. One, the next one was two miles, and the next one was three miles from the point of detonation, okay? Now, uh, when this did go off, we went through the procedure of our backs turned to it and hands over eyes, and there was no other protection. So then we uh, uh, noticed that the first ship that was one mile away went, just left the water. It left it. You could see, you could see the horizon underneath the fantail as it went up. It went past vertical, and then it came down, and that's all we've seen of it. The next one went on up, not quite vertical, that which was two miles away, and it dropped down, and it kind of bobbed around a little bit, to my recollection, like that, and it just went right on down. And the third one, after the blast was over with, this ship was the only one that was floating. The third one was supposed to be three miles away from point of detonation. 